Hi, uh, my name is John Gartner. I'm the host of du the Duty to Warn vidcast, and today we are very lucky to have Dr. Michael Tanzi. Uh, Dr. Tanzi graduated from Harvard in 1972 with a BA in personality theory. He got his PhD in clinical psychology from Northwestern University, where he served as an associate professor from 1978 to 2010. He has published a, a book and numerous articles about psychotherapy technique. And more recently, he has written uh, early and often about Donald Trump's mental health on his Huffington Post blog. Uh, and that's why we have you on the show today. And it's true, you have been one of the people who wrote early and often. Um, and let me ask you, what was it that caused you to feel like you needed to speak out about Donald Trump? So there was a particular defining moment for me. I mean, like everyone else, I was watching the developments in the primaries and was just absolutely stunned uh, that this man, Donald Trump, could get away with making vile, outrageous, grandiose, despicable statements about one group after another, uh, starting with Mexicans, their rapists and murderers, uh, etc. I really thought, like most of us, okay, when he said that about John McCain, because many of his supporters are f more from working class, military, uh, uh, non-college educated families, and he's disrespecting a war hero who was offered to his release to come home, and he said, no, it's not my turn, um, because his father was, I think, the admiral of the Pacific fleet. So, yeah. you know, uh, week after week after week of this kind of thing. Uh, then um, he won the Republican primary, um, and people thought he would do a so-called soft pivot and calm down. Um, uh, instead, what happened during the uh, Democratic National uh, uh, Committee, uh, Democratic National Conference, um, he, and this was the moment for me, when he uh, denigrated the Khan family. Uh, here they are, these, these uh, still grief-struck parents with this uh, uh, Muslim son who was a war hero. He graduated from the University of Virginia. He had options. He didn't have to go to war. He didn't have to go over there and put himself in harm's way. And not only did he do that, but, um, uh, you know, on the occasion of his death, um, they were at an outpost. They saw a car coming. Everybody started to move forward. He said, no, you guys stay back and let me investigate this. And sure enough, it was a car bomb. It exploded. He was killed. These parents were heartbroken. And um, so when they spoke at, at the uh, Democratic National Convention um, uh, and Trump responded in the way that he did, uh, that was enough for me. And in the meantime, John, what was going on, as you may recall, is that so many people were just completely bewildered. Okay, how could he say this? How could he think this? How could he do this? Yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, the American public just simply, you know, it was absolutely baffling. Well, this is when, you know, I don't practice clinical psychology outside of my office ever. I'm disdainful of those who do. Um, you know, by and large, where they're shrinking their friend or they're offering advice on this or that. I don't want any part of that. Um, and I certainly didn't ever have any idea. I didn't care who, you know, I think like you said in one of your writings, I didn't like Dick Cheney. I didn't like George W. Bush. I ranted against them throughout. Boy, wouldn't it be nice to have them back now? Uh, <laughs> but I just thought, okay, yeah. they're clueless. Bush is clueless. And, uh, um, Cheney is evil, and that was that. I was not interested in going any further. This situation was different yeah. because people were asking, he can't possibly mean that. Well, the fact is that he does mean it, and that he did mean it, and that the American public deserved an explanation from professionals who could make responsible, yes. systematic, uh, in-depth study. And so I was gobbling up everything. I'd read his tweets every morning. Uh, every interview that I could find, and to try myself to make sense of this man. Yeah. Um, so the first, the first paper uh, was uh, August 3rd, right after this uh, uh, unconscionable treatment of the Khan family. 
And what I decided to do was not say he's a narcissist or he's a sociopath or he's a pathological liar. What I decided to do to, to tread this, find this balance, was to present to the American public, these are the diagnostic criteria. There's nothing complicated about them. They're right. based upon overt behavior. Right. They're not based upon, I think at one point you talked about the gold water business where they were talking about potty training. We're not talking about potty training. We're not talking about phallic uh, 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 castration anxiety or any of that. We're talking about what the man says and does. Right. And these that's aren't what theoretical constructs. These are behavior and words are that are observable. Yes. Words and behavior that a fifth grader could understand. Right. And so what I did was I simply laid it out. These are the criteria. Uh, I, I, I talked about when there is a so-called character disorder or personality disorder, the hallmark of that, and people need to know this, the person does not change, right? especially if they don't see that there's a problem, which clearly he didn't, and they don't want to change. The only change that can happen is they get worse, not better. They don't suddenly have this soft pivot and become, you know, nice, respectable, uh, 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 you know, proper people who uh, think think about, you know, what is right to say and what isn't. You know, uh, I think you put your finger on one of the reasons why it is, I think, um, malpractice of, of sorts that mental health professionals have not come forward or didn't come forward. Absolutely. Because everybody was optimistically uh, hoping for and predicting this pivot. It's going to go away. Right. And yet with the eyes of a clinician, you right. or I or any of these people who specialize in these areas could say, no, no, it's, it's not going to get better. It's going to get worse. Right. And that's a very important piece of information that the American public did not have when they went to the voting booth in November. And once he was once he won the Republican nomination, yeah. okay, then it really became serious. It was still utterly incomprehensible that this this monstrous guy could actually win. But um, so again and again and again, I like I'm sure you and others. OK, now he said it. Now he's done it. Now he can't possibly survive this. And again and again and again and again, he landed on his feet and his ratings went up. Yeah. So uh, that's when um, that's why I decided to speak up. You know, I'm very interested in the evolution of your writing. In the beginning, uh, your early articles, you came to the conclusion that I think most mental health professionals who discussed Donald Trump came to, which is they saw him in the area of personality disorders, narcissistic personality disorder, antisocial, right. paranoid. But as your writing evolved, you started moving more in the direction of diagnosing his thinking as delusional, which would therefore make him psychotic, which is a much more severe uh, diagnosis. You specifically talk about uh, delusional disorder. Could you say more about what it is that led you to the conclusion that he is not just personality disordered, but is actually psychotic? Well, it's psychotic of a certain very specific variety. Yeah. So, in again, the Diagnostic and st Statistical Manual, um, there is this phenomenon called delusional disorder. It is, it is a psychotic disorder but it's distinct from schizophrenia, whereas yes. with the schizophrenic, it's out there, uh, you know, this, these are the people that we see on the street muttering to themselves and wildly gesticulating and talking about, you know, being pursued by, oddly enough, the CIA um, and the FBI, uh, but who are, where the, the delusion is all encompassing. Um, there is no part of the person that is not psychotic, especially when they're on Medicaid. Delusional disorder is really very, very different. Delusional disorder, um, as specified in the DSM, the, the delusions of a, often of a paranoid or a grandiose nature, which are two sides to the same coin, yeah. is very carefully hidden. The people can be charming, they can be funny, they can uh, have very high achievement. They can um, be all the things that Donald Trump also can be. Um, and that's what's beguiling about it because, um, you know, they look so different. The schizophrenic on the street versus the person with the very contained sort of core psychotic 
delusions about themselves and about other people. You don't see it. You don't see it on the surface, except in those areas where the uh, where the delusion is challenged. And so this was something that I was thinking about because you know again it just it became a, a matter of uh, daily uh, fascination and curiosity about who is this guy. First, there was the question of okay, why is he getting the votes? Okay, I think we made sense of that. Uh, but who is this guy, and how how can he how can he do things like this? So it's one thing to be the con man who uh, uh, set up Trump University and scammed everybody. Um, it's it's uh, uh, it's uh, uh, one person who can get up on stage and have a pile of files. If you remember the charade that he put on, where he was divesting his businesses, <laughs> and uh, he knew he was lying. He knew he was lying with Trump University. He knew he was lying. That these were all the files that um, his lawyers had been working out. Um, if if those files had anything but blank pages in them, um, I resigned from the profession. <laughs> so he knew he was lying. He knew he was yeah. lying when he said he never met David Duke. He knew he was lying. Right. What about these areas where uh, he? So the things that stuck in my mind are the the business of the thousands of Muslims on the street gesticulating and celebrating in New Jersey as watching the, the Trade Center come down. It didn't happen, all right? Yeah. There are facts. Today is Thursday. You might disagree that it's a nice day or not a nice day, but it's Thursday. Those Muslims did not, it didn't happen. It right. did not happen. There were other things like that. That uh, So the Central Park Five is another. And this goes back to uh, 89 when these uh, uh, black and brown teenagers, there were five of them, were wrongly convicted and just kind of railroaded into jail uh, for a crime they did not commit, this brutal beating and rape of a, uh, a woman uh, Wall Street executive jogging in Central Park uh, in the early hours of the morning. Um, subsequently, some nine years later, the person who actually did it confessed he knew scenes from the crime scene, uh, that uh, uh, details of the crime scene that couldn't have been known, and his DNA matched. And he was in jail for raping. And so uh, all the kids were let out after you know spending years and years and years in prison. And Trump insisted, bellowing, pounding the table, they're guilty, they're guilty, they're guilty, and believing that. Again, there's this 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 uh, construct of imagine a reliable lie detector test. If you hooked him up to a lie detector test, he'd know he was lying when he said he never met David Duke. Mm -hmm. He believed it with the Muslims gesticulating, with the Central Park Five, um, and there were other things like that that were just very peculiar. For me, when it really hit home was the 15-minute speech to the CIA the morning after his um, inauguration, mm -hmm. which in a 15-minute speech, the last five minutes, he told three just absolutely humdingers that, in my view, he absolutely believed. First, he talked about the feud that the fake media had created between himself and the intelligence community. And he said this was 100, 1,000 percent false, that actually the exact opposite was true, that they had no greater backer than he. All someone had to do sitting in the audience thinking, okay, am I crazy or is he crazy, could have gone on his Twitter and seen dozens yeah. of insulting, denigrating twi uh, tweets about the intelligence community. The second thing that he said was um, raining, that when I came out there, I was really disappointed. I got hit by a couple of drops of rain, and I thought, okay, I'll power through it. And then God said, and he points to this guy, God said, no, Donald, we're not going to let it rain during your speech. And all of a sudden, the clouds parted, it was bright sunshine, and then right after I finished, it began pouring. Well, none of that is true. Right. None of it is true. You look at a video, it started raining. It started drizzling when he started to speak. Well, maybe for our viewers, you could define what delusional disorder is, so they know what we're talking about. And then we could talk about how you're able to assess when he is it's, believing a delusion it's, it's, versus it's, lying. It's, it's someone who 
believes it when he says the media created the feud between himself and the CIA. When he said that, this was not, I don't know, David Duke. This is something that I believe, again, if he were hooked up to a lie detector test, that he would pass it with flying colors because he believed it. He believed that God parted, uh, and again, I don't, he was not lying in my view. He would have passed a lie detector test. He would have passed. So someone who, when he says it, so when Vladimir Putin uh, looks Megyn Kelly right in the eye and says, I didn't know this Flynn guy. He sat down next to me. I found out about it later. Well, he, he's lying. He knows he's lying. It's very shrewd and very clever. There's a degree of cleverness to it that Donald Trump absolutely lacks. Um, you know, when he lies and he knows he's lying, there's nothing smooth about it at all. So the distinction is the delusions are contained. It's like a cancer inside. It's there. You can't see it. You don't know it, but it's there. As opposed to a cancer in, let's say, an advanced stage of metastasis where it's all over the place and you see its evidence everywhere. This is something that is uh, obfuscated by, uh, by charm, often by high achievement, um, etc. They don't come in. Go ahead. So how do you know when he knows whether what he's saying is a lie or not? Well, uh, that's a great question. Uh, I think it's not so much a matter of absolute knowledge. Mm -hmm. That would be grandiose on my part in its own mind. It's a sense of a clinical instinct for, so for with David Duke, he knew he was lying. There was nothing complicated about that. I believe based upon his uh, uh, certitude with regard to the Central Park Five, for example, the Muslims gesticulating, he had a chance to say, well, you know what? It was really in Pakistan that those Muslims were uh, uh, celebrating. Not, he had a chance to do that. He didn't care about that. He believed that, he believed. So it's the, it's the uh, not just uh, the, the, the sort of single statement, it's something over time that he continues to adhere to. My crowd extended all the way back to the Washington Monument. I know that. It must have been the angles that misrepresented it. So it's, 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 uh, it's not a matter of like, today is Thursday and I know it's Thursday. It is a matter of um, uh, evidence coming in from different locations in a way that requires an explanation and that, that uh, the consistency and the coherence of the pattern, uh, again, points to this notion of delusional disorder. I think we also see it, go ahead. Well, the way some people have, because it is tricky, as Lance Dotus put it, um, he tells two right. kinds of lies. The sociopathic lies he tells to others to fool them, the normal lie, the Putin right. lie, and the lies he tells to himself to right. maintain his own grandiosity. And it's not always easy to tell which is which at any given time, and it may be fluid, and he may not even know. But right. one of the maybe distinctions that we can use or, um, uh, is sort of just a logical one, which is if he's lying in a way which actually doesn't advance his self-interest. Uh, in other words, we know why he would lie to someone about Trump University. He wants to take their money. Um, but if he says it was, uh, I had the biggest crowd size in history, that is a demonstrably false belief, right. which is part of the right. definition of a delusion, right? A demonstrably right. false belief. You just it's have to look at the picture. It's there, right, right. right. So you know, a, a rigid really adherence to a demonstrably false belief uh, and a, 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 a provably false belief uh, that Videos. offers him no uh, advantage, that can't help him right. in any way, can only make him look crazy. Makes him look foolish. So I also uh, made that distinction in, uh, uh, in the fall about those two kinds of lies. Uh, and I called it uh, uh, a lying when you know, and then lying, which is kind of a, a, a truth lie, because you happen to believe, convinced yourself, like the propagandist, right? If you say it again and again and again, you get yourself to believe it. And those were the lines that I was thinking about. But I do think that um, uh, when there is this rigid adherence, no, 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 they're guilty. The Central Park Five is guilty. Well, what about all that? No, 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 no. They're guilty. They're guilty. They're guilty. So, um, impervious uh, to evidence, impervious to proof, impervious, impervious to facts. They're out that they each got, you know, they got it. There was a million, multi million dollar lawsuit, uh, the DNA evidence, et cetera, et cetera. It didn't happen. They were innocent. 
irrefutable evidence. It's not, is it a nice day out? Well, you know, some people don't like sunny days. Um, so, uh, but, so I was thinking about that also in terms of his ability to fool himself. But um, uh, I, I was just very, very uh, taken by his demeanor. He looked sort of crestfallen. He looked like he was being picked on uh, in this tape to the CIA, the speech to the CIA the day after. And I think it's more than just the self-propaganda where he he says, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the, who's the Saturday Night Live guy? John Lovitz. Yeah, right? that's the ticket. Yeah, <laughs> ticket, that's the ticket. Right. So that's not delusional disorder. That's fine to yourself. Right. Delusional disorder exists and worldview uh, emanates from that. And everything else falls into line with that. There's, there's a wonderful term that I mentioned uh, that doesn't come from psychology, it comes from philosophy, and the, the term is solipsism, and you're, you're probably familiar with it, and uh, in, 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 a, in a situation of solipsism, solipsism, the sol solipsistic individual believes that his belief is the only true reality, and that his existence is all that really exists, and that um, everything else and everyone else, and this is, this is I think, captures the man, is either an ornament, think of Melania, or an impediment, think of little Marco, uh, uh, to, to, uh, uh, to uh, the true reality, which only I know. Um, so I think he has these ideas about himself that, you know, I alone am perfection, that um, uh, uh, of course I'm never wrong because I know more than everyone. When he says he knows more than all the generals, I think he believes that, and that wasn't just self-propaganda. I think it emanates from uh, this central view of uh, uh, grandiose delusion, and then the other side of that, which is paranoid. Those are the people that disagree with me and try to thwart me and get in my way. So there are really two sides of the same coin, the grandiose delusions and the persecutory exactly. delusions. Yeah. Maybe you could say exactly. a little more about how those two work together. So one of the things about Trump uh, even after he was elected, these stadiums that he goes to and basks in the 15, 20, and then he'll talk about the fact that, well, it's not, it's actually 15,000, but he makes it 30,000. And he just basks. He knows how to work the crowd. He knows, like the demagogue that he is, he knows how to play on emotions um, and uh, seeks out this adulation to confirm um, his grandiosity, his grandiose view of himself. Then there's the other side uh, that has to do with vengeance uh, and people who, you know, a cab driver who says something about him and Trump finds out about it. Uh, literally, I'm exaggerating a bit, but the slight, you know, the, the Miss Universe contestant, um, uh, he couldn't let that go for days and days and days and days. And he has to strike back and retaliate, and as he says, someone hits me, I'm gonna hit him back harder and harder and harder. So I think that um, the, uh, uh, so there's adulation and there's vengeance, there's those who adore me and those who would attack me. And there's, it's binary, there's right. only there's two. Two kinds of people in the world, those who adore me and those who attack me. It's a, and those who binary misguidedly attack me because yeah. they are my enemies. Now, interesting, if we bring this right up to this past week, for example. Hmm. What concerns me here, because if we're talking about delusional disorder and we're not talking about crazy like a fox shrewd, someone who's crazy like a fox shrewd is calculating, is careful, is deliberate, thinks about the angles, thinks about the consequences, uh, such as Vladimir Putin, that's a great example. Um, as opposed to someone who is deluded, if you will recall in the primary, uh, it looked like he was going to just completely melt down after the DNC. Um, and then Kellyanne Conway came in and got him to stop saying all the outrageous things he was saying. And for three weeks there, it looked like she had succeeded where no one else had. And then sure enough, as the, the statistics went against him, sure enough, he uh, went more and more off the uh, teleprompter and started saying these things about the Second Amendment people. Maybe they can take care of Hillary. Anyway, went more and more and more rogue. Um, 
and then it uh, then it happened. Then the Comey, uh, eleven days before, about the emails came in, and he pulled it back together because all of a sudden, the statistics were starting to go heavily in his favor. And he pulled it back together again, and he won the election. Um, uh, had that Comey thing not come out, um, there are many reasons why Hillary uh, didn't win. But I think that had the Comey uh, position not come out, he would have continued to deteriorate. And so what I'm concerned about now, yeah, I'm concerned about right now, right. if we think about what went on when he was in Europe, when he spoke to NATO, um, uh, he would call this fake news, but consistent news reports were, he'd said all these terrible things about NATO, um, which is very suspicious because of the wonderful things he said about uh, uh, Putin, etc. Uh, and apparently he had, as news reports indicate, his speech was handed to him. It was carefully crafted, I'm sure, by uh, uh, Mathis and McMasters and close advisors in which they were delicately, diplomatically trying to repair uh, all the negative things that he'd said about NATO as being obsolete, as being, you know, people aren't paying, etc. And uh, as my understanding is he took that speech and then didn't read, either, he either took that stuff out or he read his own speech, but he went, the point is he went rogue. He did right. not trust his, his advisors. Yeah. He comes back here, the nicest, to, the noose is tightening. His lawyers are telling him, do not use the word ban, do use the word ban, uh, because you will never get it through the courts using the word ban. And he came out, capital letters, Monday morning after coming back, ban, 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 ban. Uh, forget about what the lawyers say, forget about it, et cetera, et cetera. So when he goes rogue like that, the potential, in my view, for someone who begins to think about enemies everywhere, enemies everywhere, the potential for impulsive, uh, incredibly destructive uh, kinds of actions and attacks, uh, it's there. And we will see as this FBI, CIA investigation unfolds, we have to remember this man has the codes. This man has the nuclear codes. In under five minutes, they're in the air. People have this notion that, uh, generally speaking, it has to be filtered. It doesn't have to be filtered, except under extraordinary kinds of uh, scenarios, which I imagine people like McMaster's and Mathis are thinking about. How do we get a filter in there? Because in, uh, generally speaking, it's built not for debate, but for expedition. Under five minutes, they're coming. He believes they're coming. Uh, and, so, and, and is he going to believe they're coming when they're not coming? Is he just going to have this idea that, you know, like, is... Like the Muslims. The, the, like the Muslims. <laughs> if he gets this idea and he believes it, what is it that he's capable of? And I don't think we've seen the worst of it. And it's extremely alarming. Well, uh, yeah, because I think, you know, you were right the first time when you predicted that he was going to get worse, when everyone was hoping he was going to get better. And what I hear you saying is we haven't seen the worst of it yet. That based on what we know about people with delusional disorder, first of all, prognostically, as you've written about in your article, they tend to get worse over time anyway. But secondarily, what you're saying is when he is challenged, when he is cornered, when his narcissism is threatened, he decompensates. He becomes more delusional in his thinking and more impulsive and more aggressive and more paranoid. And rogue. more rogue. I like that word, rogue. That's a good one. And now that the Russia noose is tightening, because I think he is guilty, BTW, right. uh, this is now June 8th, 2017. We're making this prediction now. As he is more cornered and threatened, based right. on your uh, assessment, we right. would expect. Oh, we had the Comey the thing this morning, the day exactly. the morning that this is taped. Right. right. This is taped. The day, this is Comey Day. Right. Uh, the day of Comey's testimony. Uh, Therefore, based on your clinical assessment, we pre you would predict that he's going to go more rogue. I think that um, the, the evidence for that is mounting, and I just hope I'm wrong. But I'm telling you, John, if indeed, if indeed, and this isn't a slam dunk, but there's considerable and mounting evidence to suggest we're not just talking about a con man, we're not just talking about... Uh, a self-absorbed son of a bitch. We're talking about a guy who has psychotic core beliefs of grandeur on the one side and the other side, 
there are enemies everywhere. The, 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 the dystopian view that he talks about of the carnage in America, etc. And so my concern is, and I really, I sincerely hope I'm wrong. I don't want to be right about any of this. But I if I, to the extent that I am right, uh, we are in a very perilous time. Yes. More perilous than I think people realize. If indeed the delusional disorder exists, then we have no idea what this man is capable of. It's, it, it's, it's as bad as one can imagine. It's really a, a worst got, case scenario. It's the worst case scenario. Right? Yeah. Well, we, we picked the name Duty to Warn for a reason. Yes. Yeah. Writing and the speaking out that you've done. Right. You for yes. warning, helping to warn the public. Um, and like you, I hope that we're wrong. Right. I do too, John. Uh, but I think we're largely right. We may not be all the way right, but even if delusional disorder doesn't exist, and we go back to the more uh, innocuous, still the impulsivity, the self-centeredness, the feelings of persecution uh, that don't rise to the level of delusion, um, uh, we've never been through anything like this in our history. It's a danger to self and others, and it means all the others. All it means the others on planet Earth. It, it means we exist one second, and the next second we don't, along with everything and everyone else. That's what happens. You know, at two in the morning, he launches. We we don't wake up, um, and it's and it's all gone. It's just it's it's the it's the ultimate existential threat. Wow. At, in one of the papers I wrote about uh, uh, Bigniew Brzezinski, when he got the call at the end of the Carter administration that Soviet bombs were coming in, he because he had this experience, he told the aide, go find more verification. The aide called back in less than a minute and said, it's not 2,500, it's 25,000. So he at that time, uh, he is wife was sleeping. He didn't wake his wife up because he knew she would be dead. Uh, and he wanted her to die in her sleep. And he reached for the phone to call Carter. And a third call came in saying, no, 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 no. It was all a mistake. It was a computer glitch. Imagine, imagine if that call had come into Trump. There would have been no pause. There would have been no, let's use every second that we have. Similarly, the other great comparison in our lifetimes is the Cuban Missile Crisis, which unlike the other that lasted for five minutes. Most people didn't know about it. This played out on the world stage. It was a white knuckle nightmare for 12 days. Kennedy's, uh, the mil all the military advisors were telling him, launch, launch, launch. We can get the first strike. We got more bombs than they do. And uh, fortunately, he listened to his brother and he listened to Secretary McNamara, held off on that, and they were able to come to a peaceful resolution. So. That kind of uh, equanimity under pressure, this man is incapable. So contrary to people who might say this is about politics, what you're saying is this is about an existential threat to human life on Earth. So what I said in uh, one of the early papers is this is not about uh, polit this is not about politics, it's about apocalypse. Those are the stakes that are involved. I like it's, that. I'm going to steal that line from you. It's not <laughs> Democrat. It literally, it's yeah. not about politics. It's about apocalypse and the potential for apocalypse. And I'm going to quote you on that. I think that's very, very well put. I appreciate, I appreciate it. <laughs> thank you so much for talking with me. Yeah. Well, thank you, John. Really, um, I think you know the admiration and respect I have for you more than any anyone else. Okay. You have been the political activist that has led the charge from thank the, you. you know, very early on in the game, establishing this duty to warn, going and speaking in various formats. I saw you a couple of times on Lawrence O'Donnell, and uh, just undaunted at a time when people sort of were cowering about the Goldwater rule, um, et cetera. So uh, thank you. All right. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. And thanks for talking to us. All right. I'll talk to you later. We'll talk with you soon, John. All right. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye.